municipalities to pass resolutions in support of a right to vote amendment. We need organizational resolutions, civil rights, voting rights, civic, political, labor, women, environmental, youth, senior organizations to pass resolutions, <coughs> send them to the president, send them to the leaders in Congress, send them to your congressperson, your two senators. Ask all candidates who are running for office if they support a right to vote amendment. When they show up and have community forums, when they're campaigning and so forth, and they open themselves for questions, ask them if they support adding a right to vote amendment to the Constitution. I'm trying to get organizations, you know, when candidates run for office, I've managed several campaigns, and Anytime you run for an office, president, Congress, Senate, state offices, and so forth, you almost always get dozens of uh, hey, Greg, dozens of uh, questionnaires. Now, if you get a questionnaire from a Right to Life group, what's the question that's on the, one of the top questions on the questionnaire? Do you support adding a Right to Life? amendment to the Constitution. If you get a questionnaire from the from these gun organizations asking the NRA or whatever, do you support the Second Amendment, right to a gun? Why can't progressive organizations ask the question, do you support right to adding a right to vote to the US Constitution? Personal endorsements can be helpful. Mayors, elected officials, entertainers, sports figures, anyone who has a high profile and can be influential uh, is another avenue. Grassroots petition drives. Again, it's a good organizing tool to get names on your list and so forth. Uh, again, from community groups, student groups, labor, environmental groups, religious, seniors, all kinds of organizations. And lastly, and I'm willing to, I'm 71 years old, so uh, I'm trying to keep up with these young people and this new technology and social media and so forth. If someone here knows how to get a question on the White House petition site, you know, you could put a question or something on the White House, and if you get 100,000 people to sign off, the White House has to respond to that. So I'm interested in working with someone if, if they know how to, uh, to do that. Uh, behind or at the foundation of every issue, politician, policy, or law is the vote. There is nothing more fundamental in a democracy than the vote. It's our voice. It's how we speak on public issues. It's how we elect those who represent us. It's how we can change things for the better. And it's how we make progress. One of the things I'll say in conclusion uh, that really kind of uh, sparked my imagination when I saw the North Carolina people here today, you know, in the South, mainly, but it, really all over the country. This right to a gun, you know, that's, can't take away the right to a gun. It would be interesting to me if you can find someone in the state legislature to, to uh, present reaffirming, I don't have to agree with this, but I'm saying as, as a strategy, because that's where people are, reaffirming a resolution reaffirming the Second Amendment's right to a gun. And then follow that up with a resolution. <laughs> Will you support the right to vote? And of course, you're going to get a lot of people, especially Republicans, some Democrats, who are going to you know, go gung-ho on the reinforcing the resolution on the right to a gun but hesitant on that. And of course, you can make much political hay or, or you think the right to gun is more important in democracy than the right to, a, than the right to vote. 
So those are just some of the ideas I have on that. And I can expand further uh, on what I'm trying to do with the model in Illinois if we get to some questions. Great. Well, we, uh, we have Greg Moore with us after a, a tour of the UDC uh, campus area. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a grand tour. A grand tour. <laughs> Uh, we, uh, we, we did a conference here a few years ago, I know some people might have been to that one, where it was in a different place, the UDC Law School, so that, that was more confusing for me too. But uh, Greg has uh, been another stalwart for years, uh, working on civil rights, voting rights, democracy issues, and is now uh, at the Democracy Initiative, which you say a little bit about the group should be, know about that, but also I was thinking uh, a particular focus on what is going on with Congress and restoration or strengthening the voting rights. Well, first of all, thank you, Richard. For inviting me and having me on the panel with my good friend here from several, several years. I didn't know you were 71 years old. That's news to me. <laughs> so that means I must be at least 10 years younger than you. <laughs> uh, my name is Greg Moore with the Democracy Initiative. It's a coalition between the NACP, the uh, Sierra Club, Greenpeace, and the Communication Workers of America. They formed in December of 2012, we formed December 2012, right after the election, saying we have to do something about all this effort that was being put out here to push our vote back. If you all remember what we went through in 2012 and the push to get rid of some of the provisions around early voting, uh, the push toward photo ID, all the legislators going across the country trying to make it harder for us to vote and to stop what did end up happening in 2012. Four groups got together and convened every, many progressive organizations, over uh, 60 organizations showed up uh, and made a decision to try to pull our resources to build a broader democracy movement. Uh, in 2013, uh, meetings were followed up in June of that year with another gathering of folks who were trying to commit themselves and came down to three issues. After the Supreme Court met and eviscerated the Voting Rights Act of Section 5, the decision was to dedicate ourselves to the restoration of the full restoration of the Voting Rights Act, uh, ending the filibuster that was blocking a lot of the congressional, uh, I'm sorry, a lot of the administrative appointments as well as the judicial nominations. And then the third one was uh, getting, taking a bigger step to get money out of politics, which was driving a lot of these legislators to what they've been. So those are the three principles under which we formed. Uh, I uh, was serving, I am still serving as the director of the NACP National Voter Fund, the C4 arm of the NACP. And that organization had been committed as well to mobilizing voters over the last uh, 12 years. And in that role, uh, it was important that we build a part of this network of the Democracy Initiative to include very aggressive work toward beating back some of these problems that we're having, particularly in our states. Uh, our biggest challenge has been trying to reestablish how we build support around this broad democracy movement, which includes what Frank was just talking about, the right to vote. Uh, the vehicle we were using for several years, almost for 50 years now, is the Voting Rights Act. And as you know, the uh, Supreme Court, in its great wisdom, decided that Section 4 and 5 were areas that needed to be revised. And the pre-clearance formula that was designed that was developed back in the 1960s was no longer relevant. And they charged Congress to go back and fix it. So we've been waiting since June for Congressman Conyers and Senator Burner and the members of the Judiciary Committee to put together a package that would allow us to have the Voting Rights Act reestablished in its full force. And a good effort was put forth uh, in these last several months to develop a piece of legislation and I apologize profusely for not having any handouts on this because I was sort of in the middle of a lot of different things this morning. But I, but I do have some summaries that will give you a couple of things about what did come out. Last two weeks ago, Congressman Conyers and Congressman Sensenbrenner from Wisconsin, as well as Congressman Shabbat from Ohio, who's Republican, Bobby Scott from Virginia, Sia Jackson Lee from Texas, and a few other members put together a bipartisan package. And this package does a lot of great things. Uh, one, it basically takes the new Section 5, re rewrote it, uh, so that the violations of many of these states that have been involved in these uh, voting rights uh, rollbacks would basically have uh, 
new look at their work. So for 15 years, from the day for Act 15 years, they would look at all the different violations. And if the state had more than five violations, it would fall under this pre-clearance provision. Now, it could be one state violation or several major county violations, but the combination of five would basically be uh, enough to trigger their coverage. Uh, this part of the Section 5 would never expire and would cover more jurisdictions in the future, so it wouldn't be just the states that were previously covered. Um, and it would basically look at the situations where we were not just looking at evidence from before, from 1965 and 1975, but the, only the last 15 years. In the old voting rights uh, bill, the states of Virginia, uh, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, Arizona, Alaska were fully covered. And parts of California, Michigan, New Hampshire, New York, Virginia, and Florida were also covered. Uh, the good things that kept happening with this bill was that it required the public to be widely notified of voting changes made before within 180 days of election. It enhances the ability of groups to freeze potentially discriminatory changes uh, via obtaining court-issued preliminary injunctions. That means you can't do a lot of changes while there's an injunction underway. Uh, it restored the Department of Justice's ability to send federal observers to monitor the inside the polls and it would expand the ability of the Department of Justice to send observers nationwide, so that basically put a little bit more teeth into the DOJ. It also made it easier to add and bail in jurisdictions that were not already covered for pre-clearance by removing the requirement to prove that the voting violations were intentional. So before you had to prove them intent only, but now you can also prove that the effects of the bill uh, were able to be covered. So it's a strong bill and it's a strong, it starts off in a strong place. Now here's what's wrong with the bill, and I'm sorry for, us, for going through it so quickly, but the uh, provisions that said we are going to determine what it takes to get you covered uh, have been redefined by the decision of the Supreme Court. And so the states I read to you before were the states that were covered, and I'll go through it one more time. Virginia, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, Texas, Arizona, those states have something in common. They're all in the black belt, which we used to call the black belt, but they're all where there's an end concentration of African American minority voters. Under the new formula, the states that are covered are Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Georgia. Now that's our problem. Our problem is that there's all kinds of crazy things going on in North Carolina. Everybody in this room could tell us all the crazy things that's been going on in Florida. I'm from Ohio. In fact, I spent a year of my life going back to Ohio trying to fight against a massive voter suppression bill that we were able to get taken off the ballot. We were able to get overturned by doing a pick petition drive. There's one provision I did not talk about. The bill, in its current form, allows, uh, actually exempts uh, photo ID provisions that are passed by states to be included as one of the five infractions that would take to get you sort of opted in. So that means that Pennsylvania and Ohio and Wisconsin and Kansas and all these states are going about to put these discriminatory photo ID provisions and are doing that because they are well aware that the photo ID provisions, Republicans are very aware that photo ID provisions are actually a discriminatory vehicle that's been used several times to help really dilute the minority vote. Now why is, why is that so important? Because according to the Advancement Project, in the state of Texas, in the state of North Carolina, one in three registered voters lack ID who are African American. So one in every third voter, one third of all voters in North Carolina who are African Americans do not have a photo ID. Rollbacks of early voting, 56% uh, of African American voters voted early. So when they got rid of early voting in North Carolina, guess what? That's an infraction. Uh, in fact, 70% of African Americans uh, in 2012 actually used early voting procedures. In the state of Pennsylvania, 328,000 individuals, black, white, brown, every other hue, uh, didn't have photo ID. 
don't have a photo ID. And, that, and since the legislation passed in Pennsylvania, only 17,000 photo IDs have been issued. So that means that 95% of those people who didn't have a photo ID a year after the bill was passed still don't have the right to vote if that law were to stand. And in Wisconsin, among 18 to 24 year olds who lack a driver's license, 56% of Latinos fall into that category. 66% of African American women fall into that category. And 78% of African American men fall into that category. So to exempt photo ID from one of the provisions that we're requiring to be used to trigger whether or not you're coming for free clearance is a grave error. And for those of us who, uh, and I was a congressman, John Collier, chief of staff for five years, so I, I know his work, I know his people, I know his committee. Uh, we're working really hard to make changes to the bill, but this is what is called a bipartisan bill. <laughs> so we have to make a couple of decisions, and they're not easy decisions, and this is not the easiest kind of situation to be in here because no one wants to go to the 2014 elections without a photo ID. I'm sorry, without a voting rights act. <laughs> but well, well, now, now without a photo ID, yes, exactly. <laughs> nobody wants to go to the 2014 elections without the voting rights act. So we have to make a decision as a voting rights community and as a civil rights community whether or not it's more important to pass this law now with some of the weaknesses that we know that are inherent in it in order to make sure we have the coverage and the great provisions that I talked about in some in very little detail, but basically expanding the ability to have every state bail in under your free claims versus just going with the four that are currently covered. Now, why is that important? Because litigation is the driving force behind a lot of the things that are now going to be required to get these states covered. In the North Carolina lawsuit that the Madison Project is working on with the NACP, there's about eight provisions of things that were done by the North Carolina legislature that are in one lawsuit. So under the current bill, that only counts as one infraction. And there's eight different things they were doing wrong. So the only way to fix it is to file eight new lawsuits and start all over again to see how it gets to the court. And that could take 18 months, two years, nine months, depending on how fast things are expedited in the court. But over here you have a whole bunch of additional nominations being held up by the Senate because of the filibuster. You have a situation where uh, there are judges that are still, vacancies that are being uh, upheld the Election Assistance Commission, which was formed to regulate the Health America Vote Act, doesn't have any commissioners. Out of four commissioners, there's zero serving in the last three years. The Federal Elections Commission only has two members, and it's supposed to have a lot more than that, but they can't function because they can't make the form. So we have a non-functioning Election Assistance Commission, a non-functioning uh, Federal Elections Commission, a whole bunch of issue nominations tied up in the in the Senate, and the states, and Republicans going through this full-blown uh, effort to pass photo ID and a whole bunch of other restrictions against early voting, making it harder to do voter registration. So what Frank was talking about, and we've talked about it a few times, sort of says, hey, we need a full right to vote amendment so we can stop this craziness that we're doing with all these patchwork pieces of legislation in different states. Um, so the serious issue is that the Voting Rights Act is important. We're working very hard <coughs> to change it, but we know we have to fix the Senate. We have to fix the way money is driven into these campaigns by the Polk brothers and others to impose these state restrictions on. And we have to do something to make sure we have the right to vote uh, protected in the Voting Rights Act. Strictly. So that's our challenge in a nutshell. Uh, it's why I spend a lot of my nights tossing and turning because I know very well how important it is to pass federal legislation we just got to figure out if this is the time, if this is the space, and what we need to do to actually make sure it goes past uh, this Senate. Now, in the House, they have this thing called the Hastrick Rule, where you have to have a majority of the majority to pass anything. So the majority of the Republicans would have to agree to the voting rights amendment as it is to even get through. If they don't, then it doesn't come up for a vote. So that means Republicans will be doing things to this bill to make it even worse because they have to get the majority of the majority. So you might have a bill that looks nothing like this that I just read off. 
in order to get it passed. In the Senate, they call it just a filibuster. You have to have 60 votes there. Um, but if you don't have 60, guess what? You have to start adding a lot of things to the bill that makes it more Republican feeling and sounding. So we could be in an impasse here where the right to vote is seriously threatened. If I could just close on a few other things. This carve out of uh, photo ID laws um, says photo ID is less discriminatory than other things. It's almost like saying, well, Dr. King, you have uh, the Voting Rights Act. We'll give you the poll tax and we'll give you the Ill accessible registrar, but we're going to keep the literacy test going over here just because we got to get that to the folks to get it through. I don't think they would have took that deal. I don't, frankly, I don't know. <laughs> but now I think we would take that deal. And I'm, and again, this is uh, the first time I've spoken publicly on this because we have a lot of small rooms, a lot of small meetings. Uh, but I'm concerned about it. All of our friends in the civil rights community are working very hard to get this figured out. And if I had a better answer for you, I'm going to give it to you today, but I don't. Uh, but it's the one, the one of those things we just really have to do. Uh, we have the march on uh, Selma Montgomery happening in Alabama. And next month, I know Reverend Barber has something down in North Carolina in a few uh, days. So these kind of things are going to help hopefully send the message out to the rest of the country that we can't tolerate if we can vote in rights out. And we'll do everything we can to make sure we can uh, fix it. All right, thanks. I'll be pretty quick. Um, I do want to get to some comments here. We're, we're going to go to noon and then go to lunch. Uh, lunch is going to be right outside, um, so we get that pretty quickly, and then we're going to go into these uh, working group caucuses that we'll define uh, just a few, few minutes. I wanted to connect the, the two um, presentations to the strategy that we see with the Comerigo resolutions um, and how that fits with some of the other discussion. Um, in part because I think that there is a lot of local power that could be exercised very practically toward helping on suffrage. Uh, and, uh, you know, Bernie uh, mentioned the connections that he has with, you know, 13,000 progressive local elected officials, uh, many of which are in positions where they can really move things. Um, and there's a lot more who might not be part of that network but are open minded about standing up for suffrage, right? And, and also at the same time, they participate for their own local elections, when they're not held at the same time as, as presidential and congressional elections, are often really low turnout with incredibly disparate turnouts, uh, which I think is a point that, that, that really struck me as we looked deeper into Tacoma Park uh, when we, uh, we uh, did a survey, because we have ranked choice voting in Tacoma Park, so we did an exit survey. And, but as we did it, we asked people's demographics. And, and one thing we found out was that in the ward that had the, uh, the greatest number of people of color and the greatest number of low-income people, um, they had a special election, an African American one, actually integrating a, an all white council, which was interesting, um, in a majority minority city. Um, but uh, in that, in the turnout, more than half the people that voted had a graduate degree. If you look at the uh, census block data, about 10% of people in the ward have a graduate degree. And it sort of went, went like that by age, by income. And you know, so that you know, these participation rates are really, really not what they actually. Are. The disparities are a lot less in uh, national elections, though they're still far bigger than they are in many other nations, where where uh, a lot of those class gaps in voting have essentially been erased. But we have very, 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 very big ones. Um, so there's a lot that localities can can actually have a good conversation of, about their own suffrage. I find that a uh, um, that a lot of local officials are are open to that. I think they uh, would be open to more people voting. So part of the very practical reality of, of, of the promote our vote resolutions is what can we practically do to advance suffrage? And that's what the things that Tim laid out that, that uh, came forward in Tacoma Park were very practical ideas and have real opportunities to change things, uh, not only in the Tacoma Park elections, but in the elections that take place in Tacoma Park that are national and federal. And that relates to some of the other issues that we're dealing with. So we have this great contingent from North Carolina, working with people in Wisconsin. So if you've had state laws that have been ones that can be have the potential to be very regressive, they don't have to be if people mobilize and work. It's going to be hard. They're probably still going to be regressive, but at least there could be pockets of resistance, right? Organized resistance. And, and that cities and counties and school boards and campuses, organizations can be, can be enlisted to institutionally be part of that effort. So if there's a, uh, a photo ID law, you know, that, they, that a campus could could get committed to make sure no student on that campus doesn't have one. Um, the you know the the 
administration can make that commitment to say no one's going to be denied the right to vote for that reason. We are standing up for suffrage because we believe in the right to vote in the Constitution. And that's where I, I think having that big call out there is a reminder that we all do, you know, talk about the fundamental right to vote. In fact, the president talked about the State of the Union speech. And if you uh, do your citizenship test, I think it's like, what, what's like, what's the most important right that we have as Americans? It's like the right to vote. So we do believe in this, but we should put it into law. And there's very practical consequences to not having it in the federal constitution. I'll mention one that relates to, the, to, to these two presentations also is that there's very important litigation going on right now in Wisconsin and, and Pennsylvania related to the photo, aid, the photo ID laws, which, by the way, is not just photo ID, but what kinds of photo ID, right? It's like some kinds of photo ID are more accessible to people than others, and they restrict, you know, oh, you can't use your student ID, but you can't use another one. Um, but um, the, these will be uh, interpreted by state courts, and state courts, they can look at their state constitution. Actually, we have the right to vote in a lot of state constitutions. Not always with the phraseology that would be the strongest that you might want. It could be better, but it's often there. So, which is, relates to this fact that it's a state right. It's been, it's been extended at that level.